So, yeah, I mean, firstly, thanks to Free Agent. I don't know if Matt's here somewhere at the back. I'll, I'll say, I don't know, should I say a couple of words? Or? Okay. Well, I've got two main things to say about Free Agent. The first is that they, they're the eighth fastest growing tech company in the UK last year. Um, and they also obviously provide, as you can see from here, uh, hopefully um, cloud accounting software. That's probably the most concise description. And also, um, if you're subscribed to the Meetup group after this, I'll do a blog post in the video and everything, and photos if anyone's interested. Uh, but within that email, there'll be a link to a three month um, free offer from uh, Free Agent if anyone uh, needs uh, cloud accounting software package to uh, be uh, pretty much the leaders in the in the field. As, as I have to say, but I think it's probably pretty much accurate, particularly for the, the smallest smallest companies and startups. Um, thanks to Pete and Tom for coming along. Um, I met them at Table Crowd. I don't know if anyone have heard of that website or platform, but it's a great um, place to go to meet any group of people for a dinner. That, um, and the theme of this particular dinner, Table Crowd, was all about mop.com with these two guys and lots of other people interested in those similar types of platforms. Um, so I thought it would be great to sort of chat to these guys about how what they've done and um, their story as such. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's it from me. But I don't know if you guys want to say a couple of words about your background, how you met, yeah, uh, how you started. Just yeah, be brief um, and then we'll go into the questions. Hopefully the microphones work. Is everyone going to hear me? Yeah, I think that works. Um, so me and uh, me and Pete met university. Uh, what, 10 years ago now? Yeah, I think. I'll tell you. Um, I did economics and Pete did law. Uh, we went through university, went into different jobs. I went into trading, uh, so that was my job previously. Um, but I think we always wanted to get out of the city with startups. We've been trying various number of different startups before we landed on Mop. So about, what, two and a half years ago we launched Mop? Yeah, so we launched, um, yeah, so like Tom said, we kind of were frustrated to want to be entrepreneurs for years and did nothing about it. And then um, sort of in 2012, we had a few more ideas um, that failed, which we can talk on it about, um, nice. and then came upon Mop. But I guess it was the end of, yeah, end of 2012, the start of 2013. Yeah. Um, and then both left our jobs and went all in. So I was a, um, I was a private FC and m and lawyer at a firm called VLA Piper. Um, in the city and then Thomas Trading and we left to yeah just us two no employees to to try and build an online marketplace for all the time services. Yeah, that was just kind of where we got to by I think it was April time. Yeah, so about first, April thirteen. First of April we launched, yeah, thirteen. Wow. So all pretty quick, which pretty quick. So I guess why so many people are interested in that they probably do the same thing. Um, okay, well I'll go straight into all the questions. Um, but I guess the uh, the first one Connected to the theme of the event is when you started off, did you actually have an idea or plan to um, sort of exit in about two years, or was it a happy, happy time of events? I think in the first, if I'm completely honest with yourself, when we first got going, uh, we didn't quite know what was happening or where we were going to go. Um, the it was just an idea at the time when we started building, like building it. We didn't really know it was going to be going to work, um, and then once we started. Kind of gaining traction, and for us, that was like people putting through bookings online. Um, because before us, really, there was, you know, there was no way to actually physically book a thing online. So, um, so yeah, then we started getting traction, and then after that, it was, you know, how big can we go? But I don't think at any any point we kind of yeah. actually wanted to sell in the early first, first two because years. It'd be dangerous to, like, I think we always thought to structure and start a business with like the, the concept that you're going to try and flip it within two years. I mean, it's fine to do, but it wasn't like a most space price, it was more. Um, we were hoping that we'd build something and a byproduct of that at some point could be an acquisition, a merger, an IPR. You know, we kind of had like big picture stuff. But Tom's right, at the start it was more, we need to get like a, <laughs> we need a customer. Okay. Um, and then we need to get a lot of them um, and we'll go from there. And the handy um, merger, like acquisition, was it's more of a, that, yeah. yeah, two parties come together, got on really well and it made sense. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to say how that, what, what the, the considerate, what, what was involved that made you want to, uh, Exit as such, or I guess you're still involved with Handy. Who's yeah, involved yeah, very much so. Yeah, so we, um, so yeah, Handy. So if anyone doesn't know, um, Handy is um, was similar to what we did, but in the US. So there were 27 cities across America and Canada. 
Um, so we're now the leading <coughs> global leading online home services platform. Um, and yeah, and then we did their quiders back in September last year. Um, I know the deal, you know, it was, it was something that worked for me and Tom. Um, we're still with the company, we run the international business. Um, and we love it, yeah, we're having a great time. Do you have like um, angel VC investors that you had to, you had to sort of approve the deal as such? And yeah, we'd raised, um, we'd raised about $1.5 million of venture capital. Um, so we raised a really small bit from friends and family, yeah, people that were backers, yeah. that are stupid enough to back us at the start. And then we raised a venture capital round from a, um, a European VC in the December. Yeah. Yeah, Boxing Day. Um, okay, I've got a, a question from Alex. JQT, I don't know whether that's your surname or whether, actually I don't think this particular Alex is here, but there's quite a few Alexes here who signed up. Um, but his question is, I guess going back to the beginning, um, did you start with a, a website or mobile app? And whatever your answer is, would you do things differently? Now? Yeah, so we um, we started with a, a web website. Basically the way we got going is, um, so we were kind of still working, we didn't quite know if this was the concept was going to work or the business was going to work. So we um, we basically, we're non-tech, yeah, which kind of made it harder. We basically found a guy uh, from our university that um, basically said he would build us like an MVP, a certain amount of money. Um, and all you could do on this site was like, there was initially like two pages, so you could go on the first page, you could pick, um, you know, how many cleaners you wanted at the time, um, how long for the date and the time, and just press book. And then the next page was payment, and like after that, you just book the cleaner. Um, so at this point, there was no kind of algorithm working to tell us if like there was availability. And at this point, we didn't even have any cleaners, but it was really just a test. Um, and then yeah, four days later, like after the launch, somebody put um, in, in Notting Hills, and yeah, that's somewhere. Um, that um, yeah, it was. And at this point, I'd say we didn't have any cleaners, so we're kind of like Jesus. This you know, just on that one book, and we're like, this could be a model of business. Um, and yeah, so that's what we did to kick off with. Um, but kind of on hindsight, I think for us it worked. Um, we just wanted to prove to ourselves that there was a market there. Um, I know tra traction for us in the early days wasn't huge, but you know, it's just the fact that people would actually trust, you know, trust them. Yeah. Thing I think if you try and push the mobile, the mobile's great and for us now it's, it's, it's handy. It's a global strategy is we completely focus on mobile, but mm. looking back, back in 13 to get started, for the sake of being able to do web, do it quickly, make your HTML5 so it still look nice on the phone. Um, we find in terms of just getting that raw traction at the start, say you first 100 customers, it's quicker. Yeah. There's no get to, it's quick, you can do it very quickly. What about, what about now that you've got the app and everything, which is what we use? What, does that oh, mobile. App? Yeah, oh, the, the mobile experience is like, if you yeah. use them, the most, it's like 10x. It's yeah. Because you get, you know, you can get notifications, you can change things very easily. I think it's just lighter and it's quicker and nicer. So, yeah, in terms, once you're established, I think. And if you're a business that has some time to develop, then we were kind of, Always in a rush, I guess. We, we kind of went very fast because we had this, maybe a bit of a fear that we thought, you know what, we need to be like the first and the fastest hit, mm. um, so people don't catch us up, where and we maybe hindered a bit on the product. Do you have any competition at the beginning? Yeah, I mean, we had obviously the, the kind of incumbents, so you have um, plenty of kind of off offline uh, cleaning companies around, um, and then there's uh, Hassel, I don't know if anyone's heard of Hassel. Uh, back then, like, there would be Tedal, so they were kind of on, on major rival in London, but I guess even to the, today, like um, you know, the big, our biggest competitor is, is the offline market still. It's huge, uh, London's huge, um, you know, the US is huge. Um, so it's really kind of turning those customers that maybe paid cash in hand, um, have cleaners that they found on, say, Gumtree, uh, that aren't insured, that, you know, they haven't any background checks. So it's turning those those customers uh, into our platform, basically. That's really good. Um, Somebody's asked a question related to that somewhere, but how did you, um, <coughs> how did you get, um, or have you got any tips about how you went about getting all the cleaners to, to use your platform? Yeah, I guess, in the, I mean, in the early days, um, we, I, yeah, when we first started out, we literally, it was a Gumtree post, does anyone want to be a cleaner? And now me and Pete have no idea how to clean what we do now, but in those days we had no idea how to clean, yeah. So I remember my first uh, first interview, this was for the first book and we talked about earlier. Um, I was uh, I stepped out of, uh, of the office at lunchtime and I, I was interviewing cleaners in Starbucks in Ripple Street. And you know, they were turning up telling me um, telling me that they're wonderful cleaners and I just didn't, I didn't have a clue, right? So I was like, yeah, you're yeah. So yeah, that's how we kind of started. But obviously now there's a much uh, kind of um, 
you know, a bigger process when I bought your cleaners, so like, they're all background checks, uh, they're all kind of reference checks. So there's all these, all these stages they go through to that. It becomes, I think, like a, <clears throat> we're quite an operations, there's a big ops piece to, mm -hmm. like, I think, these on demand. So we call ourselves probably like an end to end marketplace. So if you look at maybe an eBay, you go on, you transact, but you just there, you're immediately engaged with the other party and you see it through. Whereas with them, and there's a bit more of a wrapper, so around the operations, is finding that process when you're dealing with that from 10 professionals to thousands mm -hmm. and tens of thousands. Like, how can you get them from seeing an ad online or whatever channel they're coming through to like doing their first job, arriving on time and doing a great job? Like, how does that whole process become automated? And like, what physical touches are needed? And who's, so that, I guess, is yeah. the real development of the business, a ton of that, and the engineering work has been really like refining on the supply side. And, and I think the great thing about um, kind of when you get to scale is obviously on the customer side, you have the, the customer side, you have the network effects, so everyone tells everyone, you know, uh, handy mark, whatever, great. Um, and then on the professional side, so on the supply side, you have exactly the same. So we can, for instance, kind of onboard a, uh, onboard a pro professional and, um, you know, they can work more hours than they would if they went to say, I don't know, put their own ad on Gumtree or went to a, a potentially smaller offline business. Um, so that kind of resonates through the, uh, through the market as well. Supply side. Um, you said you got investors involved quite early on. How did that come about? Were you pretty proactive in doing that? Yeah, we were. I think um, we, we were quite fortunate in the sense that we were, it was a business that had like early traction. So we had that slide there from once in the deck that kind of shows the good up and to the right, the nice little hockey stick on a small scale, but it was it was looking good. So after we'd raised, like we raised £30,000 initially from like um, a couple of clients <coughs> DLA that firm I worked at with some clients and stuff like that. And then maybe over the next five months that we had a couple of inbound approaches for some um, really good angels and some other people. And um, one of those guys was a real connector for us, introducing us to like great funds. Um, so we kind of, October, November 2013, we kind of met a few funds and yeah. we messed up the light and it happened really quickly. And we kind of just wanted to get on with it. But where did the money go once you raised it? I wish we knew. Well, no, right? I, I wish. I wish it was us. Uh, yeah, we spent. Um, basically, there's a real kind of inflection point when we when we took the investment. Um, we obviously had money spent marketing, right? That was before we didn't really have any money, so um, people really thought about that. But yeah, um, and then we a, a big part for us was engineers and um, really scaling the tech side of things. But we also had to basically bring in a lot of like customer service and ask people because while the tech was trying to catch up, we obviously still had to go to business. Um, so I think from, at one stage you're up to about 47 people and we hired them in about eight weeks, which um, was a lesson we learned. We hired maybe too quickly, but because we were growing so quickly, we just had, kind of had to keep on. So yeah, it was crazy. It was, we were in this yeah. office space as a, I don't know if anyone knows, co-working space called Bathtubs and Boardroom. So we were in that place in Bethel Green, this amazing converted oh, church, we used to be a recording studio, and we started off on two desks and then moved to five. But then once we'd raised the money, we moved into a little back room because we needed more. And over that seven week period, we ended up with 49 people in, I mean, it was so small, it was like maybe a third of this. So you'd be plugging in like a new computer or phone, sparks and out. the sparks are flying out, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. But we made a ton of mistakes and too hiring too fast, and, and we, we learned a lot, but it was kind of a, a cool experience at the time. You really felt, um, it was quite cool. Everyone was sort of commenting on like, there was a buzz around getting to the office. Um, you mentioned already previous kind of city experience. Um, somebody's asked, again, who's not here, but um, they want to know how, how do you feel that previous experience was any use um, practically as well as sort of the connections you might have, you might have got from it. But there's, um, there's like technical, I think there's technical skills that, so for instance, the legal piece, um, I was a lawyer in the past, so term sheets and investment documents, you understand what they mean and what they do and, and how to do stuff like that, that's useful. But I guess for both of us more, it's the softer skills. So it's more meeting people, dealing with people, you know, having words with clients and, and certain business people, if I felt, you feel slightly more at ease, I, I think um, that was useful. And I think like work ethic. Yeah. So we're both used to kind of not having a ton of free time, so we brought it into the company. Okay, um, yeah, um, I haven't touched on this already, but generally, is there anything you do, any other things you do differently if you could do it again, or with your next next business, if you're, if you're going to be handling it? Oh, there's a lot we do differently, to be honest. Um, no, I don't know, like, it kind of piece touched on earlier, hiring, one thing we didn't put enough uh, focus on in the early days was hiring, we were all about kind of growth and scaling. Um, so, yeah, at times we hired too quickly and kind of 
fired too quickly, I guess. Uh, so that was a big one for us, I guess. Yeah, it is. I think it, the, the team is uh, still a hard piece, and even now today, you're working constantly on it because it's one of the you don't really get taught how to like manage people. So you go from like, I was like a juniorish lawyer, so I was basically managing myself and just having through due diligence and stuff to them having sort of 30, 40 people like looking at you for like direction. And when the company's going, so yeah, we we tons of learning points on on the people side of the business. Uh, and then maybe a bit more, product, yeah, yeah, another one was saying was the product side of things. Um, really to focus. We were so worried that the market, you know, other people would come in and we kind of lose our momentum and maybe not raise money in the end or whatever. Um, so we kind of, yeah, just went for scaling. And with that, all these highs. But I think in, in hindsight, we put a lot more focus on the actual product and making sure we have a good platform from the start. To, yeah, you to quickly realise as well that you have this fear that all, all competitors and whoever's in the US and the UK and everyone, you know, you're going to get destroyed. And, mm -hmm. and in reality, like, the horrible problems you're going through on a daily basis, so is everyone else. Yeah. And, um, and you don't have to, like, we were going so hard that it almost put the business in jeopardy because the, the product was struggling to keep up with the demand. So we were putting, like, amazing growth, like 3x in a month on the board. But at the same time, we had a product that was breaking. And mm -hmm. so it got better when we finally realized, guys, let's slow down. Yeah. Like, let's just <laughs> slow down a little bit and control it. How do you deal with, um, obviously, if you had problems with trying to uh, maneuver an engineer or whatever, um, sack people for one of the better expressions? Is that a bit of a, uh, a headache or a difficult time, or is this something that you have to deal with and do if you're, if you're growing that fast? Um, in terms of this kind of the, the getting rid of people, um, it's, it's never nice. You don't want to do it. Um, but if, uh, look, at the end of the day, if you're a startup, every person counts, right? Not like, you know, I, I, I worked in a big corporate and people can kind of get by just kind of coming into work at nine, finishing at five and, and just getting by, right? Whereas in a startup when you're kind of a bit more capital constrained, everyone has to be kind of working working hard and really um, making a difference. So it's, it's one of those calls, it's a tough call every time, but it's only done with it, but you kind of have to. Do you kind of have, um, I guess one of the ways to keep people interested and motivated is to have some kind of uh, share scheme Yeah, it happened really quickly for us, the whole, um, the whole business. So we had, yeah, we were working with them and Young on developing a scheme and building an option scheme. I mean, in terms of what it's worth, it's hugely valuable. And yeah. it's another point, um, if we ever do another company or do something in the future, equity is a great way to incentivize. And I think there's probably more of an understanding in the US and especially in the West Coast about maybe the value of equity. In the UK, you sometimes find, even with engineers, that they'd rather have an extra, say, X thousand a month or a year, as opposed to getting a couple, you know, half a point or point two, a quarter of a point in equity, but really the value is there. So I think yeah, it's hugely valuable for, for the team, the motivation. Cool. Um, the question, someone who's not here, but um, in going back to the early days when you didn't have any money in investment at all, yeah. Um, what were the, what were the things that made you get get noticed, or did you tell any startups to focus on to, to really get that traction at the beginning? So. I guess in the, in the very early days, yeah, the government literally didn't have anything. We took it right back to basics. So we um, we were basically out flying, which uh, sounds crazy, but you know, in the early days, you kind of have to do everything you can. Um, I remember we'd, we'd be going back to our, like a, a great place to fly for us was um, Canary Wharf, where we got, actually got kicked off because it's illegal to, uh, to fly there, but great if you can get there. Um, and then another one is like by Spitzerville Market, there's a nice little pack, uh, passage where no one can get by and you kind of bombard them with flies. Um, so kind of we really went back to basics in that sense. Um, yeah. And then as we developed and got the money, then we kind of looked at other channels. You have to, I think one thing for us was, if we were completely honest, you go from like a city environment where it's not even, it's not prestige and it's not whatever, but there is that thing of your peer group, they tend to do very similar things to you. So they're all better with bankers and consultants and whatever else, so there was a bit of a bubble. And then when the time came to leave, I remember when we were flying at St. Paul's, and I'd just left DLA, and at lunch I was seeing like ex-colleagues all the time, and I'm in this mop t-shirt, um, <laughs> trying to sell cleaners to them. And then even like clients, this client came up to me, and I'd done a deal with him about a month before, he was a banker at Deutsche, and he's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, he's like, are you not DLA? I'm like, it's a long story, but we're starting something pretty cool. Um, but it's kind of like parking your ego and just being like, do you know what? We, we we loved it. Like every day, I was like, this is so much better than what I was doing before. Yeah. Um, so really, in terms of your question, it's like hard work. Just like get those initial, like if we're a consumer marketplace, we need customers. So for us, it was 
getting supply and demand, getting enough professionals and enough customers to build the marketplace to drive liquidity, and it starts to become a flywheel, people get interested, and then you can raise, you raise capital. That's the sort of basic way of explaining it. Cool. Um, I guess you already could make it beforehand, but how, how much of a factor was that in, um, would you say, in, in being successful or knowing each other and having different maybe qualities or skill sets that yeah. you had to work with each other? And then after that, sort of finding a team of people who you could sort of work with as well? Yeah, I guess like from, from our side, it's been hugely beneficial to the fact that we're kind of best friends. I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure I could do it with anyone else. But, I mean, the great thing about Star is you have, you have a lot of highs and sources, but you also have some pretty tough lows um, where you kind of just want to give up and, and go, back to, go back to your previous job. So, you, I, and I think not having someone there that kind of feels the pain as well. Um, yeah, I think there's sometimes this AM, especially at the moment, because it feels like, I don't know, like times are good and the startups and in London there's double the capital that was available last year and things are great but like properly shining a light on like the, the tough times mm -hmm. like I think with us we've been at I guess like it, it can be pretty rock bottom so mm -hmm. just having someone to bounce off and someone that when you're down they might be up and if you're there down you're up it kind of balances it out I couldn't have done what was a solo founder I'd have given up many a time are you able to sort of elaborate on what um, where some of the tough issues that made you want to go back to the drudgery of uh it was never that bad, I was never going to go back to yeah, yeah, that's, that's the sentence. But, um, but yeah, I think from raising capital, issues with them, you know, you're trying to close around quickly and efficiently. Um, ops and engineering products, and we had one point where we worked out we'd wasted two and a half months of dev, dev work from the whole team, because we'd, we'd done it. Basically, we'd, we'd built wrong, we'd create some bad legacy code that stopped development. That kind of stuff is why when you have to just get out of the office, go to the pub and just sit down and take a breather. But there was time, yeah, there was loads of those moments. I mean, massively outweighed by the good, but to say like they don't exist and it's all great was, yeah, the, the hairline's still battering with this company, I think, mm. still recovering. Um, was there anything, any other similar kind of sites or people doing the same thing or similar thing rather than you sort of took inspiration from or ideas at, at, at the beginning? Um, and then I guess connects to that question is, if somebody's thinking about startup, should they look at doing something completely Original, or is it better to sort of take something that's kind of already out there and, 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 and do it better? Uh, and that relates to what you guys I think. Yeah. Yeah. You probably influence generally, like for instance, we used Airbnb, we like the site, the design, you know, so you might combine elements, but I think if it's just kind of willful, I've seen this business and I'm going to jump all over it and just try and replicate yeah. it. Not a huge amount of those businesses will do well, it's tough. And we are in a space where it's, I mean, even if you look to like laundry in London at the moment, so there's probably eight or nine startups all doing a very similar concept, and it's almost who can now execute the other, and maybe who can raise the most capital. Um, and so in those businesses, it's kind of as, it can be a race to the bottom, you need to still look at the fundamentals, like what does the financial model of this business look like? Can we scale it, like whoever the founders are, can we actually do this? Um, yeah, know, and, I, and I, think, I think also when you actually get into the business, you soon realize that you, you, you can't kind of copy it. So for instance, like, you know, you might say like Uber, I don't know, it's on demand or whatever. Um, but you take cleaners, for instance, um, you know, they might not show up. Um, they, like, it's quite subjective, um, uh, you know, uh, service. So somebody might think someone's better than the other. So there's all these things that feed into it that, um, you know, isn't comparable with like Uber or Airbnb or some of these other marketplaces. Mm -hmm. So you quickly learn you have to, um, yeah, you have to kind of tailor I mean, you do see success when you look at Rocket Internet in Germany and they have become fully fledged members. They can execute quicker than most people. So if it's a simple list and they've done it in the cleaning space in the home services with Helpling and um, rolling out very quickly, but they're kind of going maybe more for the, uh, we prefer like owning a market. So if we're in London or New York, we kind of own them, you know, we have the best liquidity. Whereas they might, you know, let's get to the market first yeah. and then let's kind of worry about that and then scale. So you're, you're a mile wide, but you're like an inch deep. Um, and I, we personally think that's the wrong way to do these, uh, this specific business. But there is, I'm sure, there's some businesses where it probably does work. You'll get a bit of value out of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, when you when you're going about building your team, um, your in-house team, not necessarily the, the cleaners as such, um, are they all employees, or do you sort of contract with a lot of people outsourced to to uh, elsewhere outside the UK, maybe? Or and and what was your um, Tried a bit of outsourcing in the early days um, on the tech side, and it just it just didn't work for 
us. Um, so after that, we kind of made a conscious decision to, to in-house everything. As, well, I guess as much as we can. Um, so yeah, with the tech, we brought them in. We found, we just found for us, it just worked better. Um, we got things done quicker. Um, you know, being non-tech as well, it was hard for us to say, so I Skype and speak to someone in another country, yeah. Um, we'd rather have them in front of us. But with that, it's obviously harder to find these guys. It's pretty hard, especially on the engineering side. Um, but yeah, we found, um, yeah, we wanted to control everything and have everything in house. Use word of mouth a lot for finding people or yeah, agencies or definitely ne network is, is definitely the best um, best way to find people. Um, we kind of looked at a bit of recruiting stuff, but it didn't really work out for us. But yeah, definitely the network. Yeah, so only on the engineering side, it all came kind of word of mouth. And network. So you have to build it, I think, if you want, especially like. London will get more and more competitive for great engineering talent and like a great engineer is worth like six average engineers work, you know, so you really have to spend time on it doesn't just happen, you've got to like reach out to investors and people in your company. So if we're looking for this position and really use the network and other founders to try and spread the word and see if you can find the right person. Yeah, um, how did um um handy come about? I guess it, it probably happens with industries. It's, it's um, you know, we're, we're talking, so we, we talk to like Hassle, we talk to like, uh, Homejoy, um, and obviously, you know, we speak with Handy, um, or we've already spoke to with Handy. Um, and so, yeah, we were kind of in touch, in touch with them, um, and then we were kind of looking at raising another round, um, and kind of they, they put an offer together for us, which, which worked. Um, but one thing we learned is, you know, never. Never not you know engage with your competitors, right? Because you're kind of all going through the same the same things together. So. You, didn't, you didn't try a sort of um, a competitive process to kind of get other people in a, in a similar industry or other interests. No, this was oh, a, I mean for us it was basically we had there was um, like term sheets on the table to do a Series A and to move that way and go fast. But if I think if we were like dispassionately looking at our model and what we needed to to get it to where we really wanted it to be, we had like no interest in being. Another like three global flight. We wanted to like be up at the top, and looking at the amount we were raising at Series A again, where we'd need to get, and then against the partnership with Handy and the deal that was there, and you know after a lot of back and forth, um, it, it, we were weighing it up. It was better for us and the company and, and the team to, to actually you know take the decision and, and go with Handy. Now there will be people, and maybe it's justified to say you know, sell out, you sold out, should have kept going, you know, fly the British flag and ignore the Yanks. Um, but for us, it was we, it's worked really well, and actually, the, the proof's been like over the last sort of seven or eight months. It's been a, a, it's not a negative experience. It's been a really good one. Yeah, we're kind of um, you know still sort of power to to build the business as we want. So there's, there's nothing you feel that perhaps you might have missed out on from from not having that I don't know, the same degree of independence you had before. Well, I mean, no doubt, no doubt about it. No, if you said to me ultimately, if, you know, Pete, you want to be founder and you know, like control everything because yeah, right, you're a control freak yeah. or um, you know be part of a big company you want to be the founder but I think in this industry and the process and we're kind of going through a period of learning um, so Handy have brought on some really good people so Jeff Pedersen just joined as CFO from um, the number two financial spot at Amazon and um, Ken Little's just joined um, as the CTO from, from over Tumblr yeah. so maybe learning a bit more you know we had we've got tons of gaps in our knowledge yeah. so um, you know fill in those gaps and, and have fun yeah, I guess you always look, yeah, whether it be the founders or the main guys, there's still so many other relationships to, to manage, but um, I always hear a lot of people having issues with problems managing relationships with investors. I don't know whether you've had any issues with your investors or whether they carefully chosen or whether there are any particular stories in, in respect to that you can share. Um, I think we benefit, we benefit a lot. We um, Our investors, you know, there is a ton of operational experience from the investors, so. In that side, we were helped hugely of building marketplaces, how to build liquidity, um, how to scale out the product, and, and, and you know work with the team. Um, but yeah, there's ups and downs. Definitely, you know, there's directions you might do some things that maybe you wouldn't have done if it was just the two of you around the table in terms of product decisions. And for instance, we probably launched an app quicker than we would have, yeah, um, and maybe didn't put enough because you know the investors were really keen to be the first to market the app. Still works really well for us. So there's loads of, of stuff like that, but I mean, by and large, we actually, you know, we're, we're supportive of them. Yeah. Yeah, we've got going. We learn a lot. Mm. One of them, yeah, I mean, would you say you've sort of gained amazing technical skills or in, the, in the last sort of two, three years, or what are the main things that you really, you really felt that you developed doing or learned as a result of the 
prototype? I think on a kind of top level, it's, it's, it's kind of executing quickly and realizing the importance of it. Um, certainly, if we were to go again, like we feel like we're in a much better position to really kind of understand the market and, and, and execute quicker. And then I guess feeding into that is like another one for us is like managing people, like HR, stuff like that. that you know, we'd never really done on a, on a large scale before, um, and it's pretty hard. Hard work. Oh, we've definitely found it hard work. So yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things that I think, um, and then just yeah, on the on the actual engineering side and, and kind of the product side and things like that. We've, we've yeah, it's funny how we talk about this when you look at problems now. You look at it. I remember back to when we started Mop and the problems you foresaw weren't really the problems that came up. And now, yeah. if we if you ever start something else, you know. You, you, you look at problems in a lot different way. You, you kind of can see some of the roadblocks that you wouldn't have seen before. So I think Tom's right, speed is, is one thing. Also quality of execution, I guess, maybe um, you know, the quality of the team you build, um, you know, the product you're building, and maybe the vision. I think um, thinking a bit bigger, so yeah. not thinking too small. One thing where I think a lot of people we've met from the US, they're great at not being scared of, of thinking massive, like moonshot stuff. But you know, even when it comes to valuation, you know, quite your corner on metrics, and if you believe you have something good, it's kind of having a much more rigorous thought process of, you know, we're, we're just as good as the people in America, you know, we can, we can do whatever we want. Um, okay, so you've got your sort of uh, cushy executive job to hand you, sort of a big, big company. <laughs> but would you, ever, um, would you ever do the same again and just pick another completely different or again, maybe a similar market and, and start from scratch again using what you... Yeah, uh, I think... I think basically, I mean, look, from our side, we're, we're fully kind of um, vested into Handy. Yeah, and we can see mass potential. Uh, the home service market is to get brick and bring that bring online. Um, so for the, definitely for the short and medium term, we're completely, completely um, into Handy. But um, look, from our side, you know, we will go again at some point. Um, we've made too many mistakes um, and, and learned too much to kind of not, I think, whether, uh, whether we'll be able to sell it in two years or whatever. Yeah, I think we're not that up. It's, um, we're pretty, you know, we're not, we're not too we need, I think. Um, if you did so, we, we're, not, uh, we're not too old. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a few years left in us, so, you know, five, six years, whatever, down the road then, or whenever. Yeah, we'd like to do some, yeah. something else to crack, for sure. Mm. Um, yeah, going back to the early days, when you're getting that MVP, minimum viable product, um, going, yeah. which I think you mentioned was, uh, I guess, a WordPress website. Um, can you sort of recommend what people should budget for that, or how much you pay, or what? Yeah, we can be completely us. We um, we built our <coughs> initial MVP for 1,200 um, pounds, um, and then I think we spent about 200 on the kind of design of it. I mean, it works different differently for everyone. We um, we agreed with this kind of uh, this grad that we do this site for fixed price. Um, we thought it was quite a good deal. Um, I think it was a good deal. Um, so yeah, it, you know that's what we pay. Um, we kind of found a great guy who's from like our old university, Sheffield. Um, I remember the professor that introduced him to Professor Roger Moore, just cracking up. Um, but he, we were lucky, and he spent time with us. And he wasn't. Um, I think if you do free lots, sometimes they'll really do you by the hour, and it's quite high fees. And he kind of saw it maybe as something he, which he did. He then came on full time after he graduated. Um, and we drank yeah tens of thousands of pounds of revenue through that side. It was. Um, you know, it was pretty cheap. Um, I mean, it was great. So the process initially with Mop was a booking would come in. There was, the, we didn't have a database. The only record we had of the booking was an email. So an email would come into our email account. The revenue had gone to Stripe. And then it would be a case of us just finding a cleaner at the start time so we didn't have any. And then we found them, so it's really, I mean, you yeah, talk exactly. about rudimentary, it, yeah. I mean, there was no database. It was, yeah. it was pretty embarrassing. Um, but it worked, <laughs> like, we got going, we were off. Um, and then we focused on making it a bit better. I'm well, given your knowledge of sort of uh, general technology scene and startups and everything, are there any, any obviously you're busy now, but any sort of areas where you see sort of big opportunities at the moment? If you were starting something new again now, what would that you want to focus on? I mean, there are loads of opportunities everywhere. I mean, we kind of purposely try not to look at them because you know, we get too excited and, uh, and, and get itchy feet. But um, I don't know. I mean, you see, like people saying, laundry, food, the food market industry just seems like it's getting crazy at the moment. All these um, on demand food startups. Um, I think there's tons. I mean, yeah, it's, it's tons, right? I think we looked at like, uh, I think you love, you know, when you see the startups like Montreal in the US, yeah. in the food space, Instacart. you can kind of see like the utility of those companies, like Instacart, fair enough, you have Ricardo in the UK, in the UK, but it's not Instacart, you know, Instacart, on demand groceries. 
there's real use cases for that in big, like big, highly dense markets. So yeah, it, you know, I think we will always we tend to we love focusing on marketplaces and you know like get interested by marketplaces. But um, but also you see amazing things happening. I mean, FinTech in London is, is yes. monstrous. Yeah. Funding circle transfer wise so far is it's insane. It actually looks like in terms of being world class and world leaders is like FinTech. It's, yeah. it's a place to be. Um, and then you have like delivery raising a shitload of money. So yeah, definitely opportunities. Um, so after you started, what were the sort of main innovations that you developed for the, for the site, the platform, and as you, as you progressed, were there, were there some of them that worked better than others and others that didn't really come off? There was a lot, yeah, so I mean, the main thing for us, the concept is um, certain other companies and people focus on building features that look great and sound great, but really we were always focused on kind of internal ops tools and tools for the professional base. So for that, it was what jobs are the professionals on the mock platforms in? And how can we make that brilliant so that they are spending the least amount of time searching for a job? Yeah. They're getting jobs that are relevant to them, that don't clash, uh, you know, the minimum amount of travel time. We were kind of really focused on what's gonna like really refine the supply base so they're really happy and they keep using the platform. And then from the customer side, really that benefits from the supply. Mm -hmm pros turn up on time, they do a great job, the customers book again, really, to be honest, the marketplace liquidity, just building that flywheel was like a zealous focus on that. And then also doing like mobile notifications, um, start to roll out and look at it on an on-demand basis, how, what are the use cases you can, you can roll in, but our like core focus was, yeah, always on the was supply, yeah. yeah. I was gonna mention it, because I, I was what prompted the question, but uh, you mentioned earlier about the whole cap, Cats on demand. Yeah, cats on demand. You can now hire a cat for a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a PR stand, yeah. It wasn't yeah. there, yeah. No, they're, they're there. Yeah, yeah. They're they're definitely there, yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, that was some So this week we launched a. Um, one thing we love to do at uh, Mob was like, you, we saw, you know, we did a lot on like people going from the city into cleaning just for press at the start, but seeing kind of PR as a channel. Um, and we continue to do that with Candy, which is. Things we did, we launched on Monday, which was Mouse is on Demand. So we partnered with Wood Screen Cat Shelter. Um, and then you can go on the handy app and you get notified and you could book a, a mouse uh, cat to come and demouse your house. Um, so really those initiatives, they've got time. I think we've got every national paper, oh, um, Mail Online, Guardian, viral. blogs, yeah. feature pieces. Um, but just premised on a really like simple concept and it drives brand value and, and helps other people. So yeah, I guess that's a good point. PR yeah. is something we spend a lot of time okay. trying to drive. Yeah, that's interesting. Was PR something that you looked to do at the beginning? Was that something that's now something more focused more on areas that you're going to look? More yeah, I mean, we we kind of in the early days we, we played on the whole um, kind of city boys league to start cleaning. You know, so we got a load of press off that, which was great. But obviously, that then runs out. So that's why we started in these other, other, other ways. But yeah, for us, PR has been a great channel. Um, yeah, uh, really has um, got some some early pieces. Um, yeah, you can really like. You can measure it, you can do, we kind of saw as a channel, we were like, we can, you know, you can drive this if it's regional. So we're in markets like Bristol, for instance, and we got, we found out from our supply base that one of our professionals has become a, a model in London, and we thought, what great piece. Push it out, it's the front page of the Bristol Post, or the page called it, that rolls into the Daily Mail. So we kind of all saw it as an ongoing initiative, and one of our first key hires was a, um, like an SEO and PR manager who really helped on a, really a strategy approach for, for that stuff. Because when you haven't got, tons of capital, you can't just go throw 100,000 pounds in the tube, yeah. you can't do these huge channels. So it's actually, you know, it's free. if you can do it right, it's like free customers, yeah, that, was, that was cool. Did you learn much, or have you learned much about SEO, or um, no. got any, what, what should people know, or what should they be focusing on in terms of search engines when they're, when they're starting at the beginning? Yeah, we, we did it, we definitely had a strategy, and we like we actually had a, like a, we bought a team of interns in, um, two of like two or three actually still yeah. with us in different yeah. roles, um, to really get a proper structure, go for SEO, rich content, media, doing landing pages correctly. But if we're completely honest, we never built the company as like an SEO reliant no. um, company. Um, it was like word of mouth primarily. It was PR, SEM was a fantastic channel for us. Um, it works at a fixed like we know what our CAC is and we can manage it. SEO is a slower burn, so you don't see the immediate customers. Um, from our perspective, so we put time into it, but we didn't just focus on it. What's an SEM? 
Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so it's like PPC pay per click. So Squad so Google, the top three spots and display advertising is basically you paying Google to show your brand. And if people click on it, you pay them for every click. Um, and then hopefully you can get enough customers through to make that um, cap the cost of all those clicks worth it. Mm. So that's probably something Depends on the model, I guess. Yeah. We talked okay, to someone the other day that was yeah. Yeah. yeah, we talked to someone the other day that was paying, I think it was in the personal injury space, law firms are now paying fifty pounds a click. As long as it's like I mean I yeah, can't even comprehend that. So in the right business it's great. But in the wrong one it could be disaster. <laughs> So what was happening is, again, you know, our, our lifetime value was a lot bigger than our acquisition cost. 
and the recovery time, so the time to pay back the cost of each customer, was really short. So like we saw some companies in the food space and we were, we were paying back way, way quicker because people were using us on a weekly basis and other things. So financially the model works for us and a handy is even better because we have a handyman and plumbers so our customers' yeah. LTV gets bigger and bigger assuming we keep the quality there. Um, so it's pretty exciting, yeah. I think some people say, oh, you know, you're, you're just skimming, you're not taking enough, it's not meaningful business, but it actually, when you get into the guts, it, it is. And how many users are there now? Hundreds of thousands or millions of globally, yeah. We do hundreds of thousands of bookings every month across sort of 30 cities and 300. Handy and Mop started at the same time, pretty well? Yeah, roughly. And Handy bought yourselves out. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what were the key uh, differences between us the two, two, two models? What were the key decisions, maybe? I that guess were made one, by one of them was, I mean, Handy raised a shed load of money, so they raised, um, I don't know, one of the first rounds about 30 million, and probably raised about what they're raising now, 60 or million. Um, so, the, you know, one thing we kind of obviously seeing from the UK and being part of our US companies, um, obviously the appetite for investing um, is a lot better in the US and making those bigger rounds on, on similar yeah. metrics, surprisingly. So, um, so yeah, capital, I mean, look, from, from their side as well, they've got some really switched on uh, co-founders, um, an amazing kind of management team. So, you know, it just kind of... I think it's a timing thing. Yeah, they had, um, oh, they went after some big markets quickly. We had London, which was amazing, but if you look at that, if you're in New York, you're in Boston, you're in SF, you can, there's a lot to go out there yeah. quickly. And I think Tom's right. There's amazing investors in London, without a doubt, um, and it's getting better month by month, year by year. But still, in terms of if you look at, okay, I'm gonna raise, in the US, you could raise a $2 million seed round with not negligible metrics, but at really early stage. And where really here, honestly, you might be raising 100K of SEIS. It's that kind of difference. And investors kind of, going with their guts and maybe trusting a team to, to get it done and execute. Um, I think we still personally like behind from what we see when speaking to US investors. It's different. When you've got a sort of platform model business like that, and you're, you're spreading to whatever jurisdictions, countries, markets, are there any particular barriers that you have to overcome to do that? Or with the, with the web and mobile, is it a business such as yours, which I guess isn't regulated so much? Be some regulate, there's regulatory pieces, so yeah. what I set up, what's the company look like, the tax structure, um, the um, you know, em employment laws, and all sorts of other stuff, and, and just getting started, so bank accounts, companies. Um, but we've not, I think, um, we've not had no, huge no, problems. Just, the US is interesting because you have the whole you know, federal state, but then you've got the state by state, so tax laws, employment law, and everything can change by state. So you can have a business, you have about 50 different approaches to them. Um, I listened to a podcast from, I think, Andreessen Horowitz the other day, and it was one of the Lyft co-founders, I think, talking about their supply model. And they have to have different routes, different funnels, they build different products for like every state from one state. So it just shows you like, some of the challenges if you want to go at scale, um, you have to sort of be able to surmount them and, and move forward, it's not, not easy. <coughs> I want to ask about your, uh, how you spent your money. It's basically um, your 30k, how did you spend them, the first 30k, and how long of a runway was the 1.5 million uh, for? So yeah, the, um, the first 30 was really just to develop our, our product more. Um, so we brought on an, an engineer, they wanted to build our MVP, um, and kind of the front of the um, a customer service uh, kind of ops person. Uh, so kind of that, that got us until Christmas, and then after that we raised a big round, which basically went into of everything, right? Just building the company, scaling, um, extra resource, more engineers, um, marketing, um, everything like that. Um, and I guess on one way, it was right, I can't remember that, maybe, that year. Yeah. yeah it's amazing how quickly capital comes out. Yeah. I think you, you know, it's a bit of financial discipline to, <coughs> to try and keep control because it can care, especially when it's all excitable and new people coming in, you've got computers to buy, you've got yeah. bigger offices to rent. You know, engineers are not up. cheap, my God. Um, <laughs> so it takes, you know, it's, it's hard to balance it, but. We, we just about managed it, yeah. Do you have like a, you have a financial director or something you have to sort of some or, or do you guys just handle everything? We there? kind of, again, and that's something maybe, if we, well, definitely, if we, we start again, we would definitely get kind of more finance and financial expertise. We basically did kind of everything. We obviously, we had our investor there, that was a great help, but yeah, we, we kind of, kind of ran the whole financial yeah. model, yeah. I remember in the early days, we didn't have any automation 
recognition of the pros that professionals getting paid. <coughs> so that would mean that once a week, and we shared this, it would be every other week that you dread the Friday. Because you had to pay manually, I was paying, so you know the card readers? So I'd add every new cleaner in, and then pay them an amount on through like a retail, like your own online banking platform. So I was just doing about 100 yeah, professionals right. and doing like, you know, paid X, Y, Z. And then you'd, you'd be going through with a ruler because you, your eyes would just lose it with the paper looking at the amounts. It was hellish, man. And then, like, then you'd cap out your bank account and it was oh. like 20 grand. So then you'd have to split the pies and then we'll split the payment the next day. And uh, They're calling up going, where's my money? Yeah, it's, like, it's just it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so thank you, Dr. How did you discourage cleaners from working directly for the clients that they've been employed through you guys? Yeah, it's kind of the, one of the biggest, our biggest fears and one of the um, first questions an investor asks when you see how we're going. Basically, what we, we're kind of building the whole marketplace. So if you think about it, on the, on the customer side, um, there's kind of a reason they go with us. Uh, one, they want to be able to pay online, yeah, so they don't want to go back to the cash in hand. They want to make sure that if their cleaner doesn't turn up, there's cover. Um, they want to make sure that if they, if they get robbed, there's someone to um, go after, you know, it doesn't happen, so a background check. But, you know, there's that security. Um, so there's kind of that side of things, and just because it's so easy, um, because we're not charging a lot, it, it, you know, it, it kind of isn't a draw on that side. Then on the flip side is the supply. So if, uh, you know, a cleaner can come onto our platform, and they can have as many hours as they want. They can work when they want. They get really good, um, you know, hourly rates. Um, so really, from their side, they're kind of discouraged to kind of risk losing all that just to maybe you know go directly to a customer for a few hours a week. Um, so I'm, sh I'm sure it happens, but it's at a percentage that we kind of built into our model and we're happy with. Um, but yeah. Is that a similar sort of thing, I guess, in terms of stopping, stopping them going to another competitor slash form? Yeah, we never, we'll be honest, we never massively, um, I think we all know that, like, we've spoken to the Hassel guys, Alex and Charles about it, I think we all share professionals to a point. Um, it's like you drive for Uber, you drive for Lyft. We just focused on making it so that we actually think we have the most liquidity. So, and um, when professionals log in onto the handy portal, they see more jobs close to the house than on any other platform. Um, I think if you focus on that, <coughs> tend to be pretty good stead because I'll tell you, you, they are way stickier. Um, if you kind of you know lock them in and do strange things, it's it's not a good experience. I think if you have to rely on that, you're, you're not you're not doing well. Um, so yeah, we kind of focus more on the the supply. You know, the, the early days, I, mean, I guess it was a difficult moment at some point, or maybe you wanted to give up. Or no, uh, yeah. So wh what would you say is uh, the, I mean, what was the worst moment for you? Um, for those of us that are starting up uh, a new company now, I mean, what should you recommend, you know, in terms of how to tackle that, you know, how to uh, kind of cheer you up? I mean. Yeah, what's the problem and how to tackle with that problem? I guess if I start the, the other way around, I have, have a good friend, you know, really strong credit man on boards, yeah, that definitely helps. As I said earlier, I think if, if we were on our own doing this, we definitely would have given up a long time ago. It's, it's pretty stressful. And then I guess our worst, like our lows, I don't know. What, what Do you know what? It wasn't like mountainous, like there, there was lows, it was more just, yeah, it was the, the week to week, just bad things that would happen. And it could be an investor thing, or it could be a product thing, or, you know, customer experience has gone wrong, which in the early days you think the world's collapsing. Yeah. Um, it was kind of that stuff, and I think it is, and when you have the pressure as well of like trying to run the business, and it's almost like there's not enough hours in the day. Um, I think having the second person to number one, not go crazy, because I think the danger of your mind when you're by yourself to overanalyze everything you do, and everyone, they're thinking this, and competitors are doing this, and investors are thinking this. Um, it's like almost a sanity check at times. It's just being able to go, you know, just take a step back and, and do it. But in terms of starting a new company, I, I think, um, you know, work damn hard, go for it. But I personally would say, if you can find a good co-founder, yeah. um, it's like the best. It's the best decision to make. If though you're a really strong technical founder and it's a really, it's like a SaaS player or something that you can maybe get done by yourself, and then bring on some senior staff early on, feel free to go for it. But personally, for us, I think it was a huge help. Yeah. Um, Yeah, 
Smithy I am. Uh, kind of, you know, I ran this guy, um, I don't know, 15 times. And on one occasion, I think he was going on holiday and he hadn't kind of got a piece together for this, um, for this article. So, um, so he managed to slot us in really, really early on. So that's great. But then when we get the PR manager in, um, kind of as Peter, the PR SEO manager, yeah. she, um, she kind of took it, took it forward there. It's, yeah, you need a bit of structure, so I was thinking, I guess, it depends on your business and um, what business you're doing, but uh, what's going to engage, I think the worst decision we nearly made was to hire an agency in the first few months of the company. We were going to pay eight to ten thousand pounds for three months of work, and these, you know, and we've seen it now in the future that they'd have gone, they wouldn't have been able to do anything. We had no service, we hadn't got a proper product. Um, it was really great, though, when we had, I definitely recommend hiring someone. Yeah. I think a PR manager can be it sounds a bit cliche now, PR manager, what a flashy hire. It's actually not. It's someone that, that's trying to help the brand and uh, really on a daily basis has a great network and will get you kind of in the, not just press, but blogs and places that are relevant to you. Um, it's hugely useful, yeah, like having a strategy from, from day dot. Mm. What, what would that role cover? Would that consider you know, the whole social media PR? To be honest, for us, it was maybe we said a PR, it became quickly like an overall kind of marketing role, so it'd be. Um, marketing the PR primarily SEO led the whole structure got us top ranked and I think all of our keywords top two positions um, and a, a ton of stuff like that and then the, the PR piece then wider marketing initiatives if you look at Mouse's on demand Tessa who's still with us led that she created it from the ground up um, amazing concept executed it in maybe three to four weeks um, from start to finish so some of this kind of, you know it's gritty it's hard work yeah great role um, you mentioned traction and getting customers. Have you got any sort of specific guidance on raising capital funding that might be applicable to all of us? Yeah, I'd say well, the biggest thing for us, I think we found, I guess, product, we found the promoter. Right now. So um, we found someone who was, um, he was at a product called Atomico at the time. It's quite a big venture fund. Um, wasn't going to invest because we were way too early for them, but liked the concept, was looking at the marketplace, um, the kind of home services place in general. And he became great, he gave us, I mean, I'm talking maybe 30 to 40 like warm intros to like, you know, top draw and then venture capitalists. So that was really helpful because it's hard, right? If you try and find, I want to speak to someone at whatever fund index or Excel or whatever. Um, and trying to make that connection because you have to build the, the relationship. Having a supporter that's saying, I'm kind of vouching for these guys, you need to speak to them. Um, in terms of the raise, it, we were managed to, you know, we raised that for the 1.5 million in about seven weeks. So. It, was, it really helps. Do you look at equity crowdfunding? Or is that something you do? I'll be honest, we, we kind of never looked at it for, for us or, or the business we were, we were doing. I, I kind of don't really know a huge amount about it, but I mean, it's, it's good. It works for us, some businesses. But um, yeah, for us, we, we kind of really wanted to bring in a strong investor. Um, you know, that we could, um, not only can give us capital, but also can add value to the business. And that's kind of what we were looking for. I think it depends what you want to do. If you're a business, for us, we knew we needed a, we, need, we wanted someone strong that would join the board. We wanted like real operational. Now, someone that never done it before, and the partner um, from the fund we had had that. Um, if I was a bit further along and I needed some, maybe some easier money that's not going to hit a load of rights in investment docs, uh, and so they still have the the equity rights, but maybe you know in terms of control and decisions. Um, then I think I saw Just Park recently raised um, a ton from the crowd. With uh, they already had index on board. Um, so that I think you know, there's use cases. Um, I think personally, I think we, we kind of prefer the um, finding like a really good venture capitalist or angel that you, you want to work with, and you build a really strong relationship with, um, and take it from that. Um, um, yeah, on the same subject, did you build a team? Did you have a team already at that stage? Because there's a common um, not conception, but part of the requirement for most VCs is you need to have a team usually already in place, but you seemed that you raised quite early. So did you we did, yeah. Well, I mean, when we raised our kind of friends and family rounds, um, it was mid-P, <laughs> so it's in, uh, but it's kind of a bit easier when you get two friends and, and crack and raise money like that. Um, when we raised um, raised from the funds, yeah, we, I mean, we had a team, yeah, we had a structure of the team in place, we had a, a kind of lead engineer, um, and yes, like SEO. You had three people? Uh, we had, I think we raised about four or five. Yeah, I think it was five, so we yeah. had like, one customer service, one engineer, yeah. whether designer, and one other. One other yeah, ops, ops person. Yeah. I think for us, the out of all those roles, probably us and the engineer was obviously the most, the most 
some more as well, hasn't he? We've got an attack battle now. Um, so yeah, without kind of him, and he's he's a pretty high pedigree. So yeah, having him on board. Yeah. One last um, follow up. Yeah. If you had to do it again, or do you think your business would take a different um, direction had you not raised any funds? Meaning, you know, if you had to do it again, would you still raise? Would you still go through the same process, or would you say don't raise so early, don't sell so early? And I think for us in in the industry we're in, we you know it's definitely the right choice to raise early and, and raise a decent amount. Um, I'm not sure anyone coming into the space now. Just I don't know, maybe home services possibly that focused on cleaning like we were on at the time would raise a kind of a, a big round. I think now Hassle have raised, we've raised, um, you know, Handy have raised. Home joy rate. I think the market maybe in the kind of semi in the US and the UK is probably closed down. So for us, it was all about speed, and it definitely worked for us um, raising that big amount. But maybe the next one, it, you know, um, kind of we might wait a bit. I'll just take a couple more questions. You're better wrap it up, but yeah, uh, that's on you. Yeah, um, just one word. Uh, since, since you're both uh, non-technical founders as well, what, what kind of challenges you know you face when you were moving from the MVP stage, you know, to into actually building the full product, and you know what kind of stuff did you have to learn, and you know, uh, you know did you have to? I mean, are, 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 are there stuff you know, that you had to know, you know, in order to like communicate with the, the engineers and stuff like that? Yeah, I think this is just. I mean, guys, huge. I'll be honest. Like when me and Tom sat down initially, it's like I was a lawyer. So like I can't do anything technical, and Tom wasn't technical. So it's really you storyboard stuff, and we'd go through. We like wireframe almost like concepts with Evan, our first engineer saying um, we like this, we want the concept for the customer to be like this. In terms of the real like evolution of how it would then get built, it was it was something that was really hard. It was kind of we had tons of back and forth, but I guess if you had a, a technical founder or even a product manager in the, in that slot, um, there wouldn't have been as much of it. Um, so we had to maybe overcompensate with, you know, me to chatting it, chatting it through over and over and then looking and finding bugs and and iterating that way. Um, yeah, really yeah and I guess for us, one of the hardest things was like our level of expectation. So because we didn't understand, we'd be like, you know, I don't know, build this whole new platform, you can do that in a day, can't you? And they're like, well, you know, so it's like really trying to understand how long these things would take. And then on the flip side, kind of, obviously you don't want somebody working for you that's like taking your time, chilling out. So it's really trying to understand what, you know, kind of what that means. And I think if we do it again, this one thing you said, you know, we. We had the vision, we knew exactly what we wanted to build, but it's, it's getting a really strong product guy in that can kind of be between us and the engineers and really deliver that vision. I think it's the same even with Handy in the US. When they're early, everyone has the same problem. Yeah. Um, they have capital and they have struggle. You have to build an engineering team and, and do it like that. But now what we're seeing is some fun. I think the engineering team are Handy now. I think we have maybe 50 developers, oh. engineers, and um, a great CTO now in Ken. Um, coming from Tumblr, it's like great new ways and a really proper structure of this is how you should develop. And do products, you know, where, you know, initiatives and sprints, and, and really kind of breaking it up and not seeing the business as one huge silo yeah. where all the engineers are working on the one big problem. It's actually tons of little problems, and you need sub teams that go attack different things, whether it's to the professionals, the customers, internal tools for the for the, um, the employees. Uh, I think that's a much when you get bigger and, and you start going, that's a way better way to to, to build and build out your engineering team. Well, that final question, yeah. That's a good one. Um, do you know at this point where do you get more serious customers from the app or from the website? We get um, in terms of mobile, yeah, it's still um, where I put mo mobile going huge, so it's, it's about probably 50 50, but about to go the other way. Um, in terms of the yeah, ton of customers now coming through mobile, um, and in terms of channels, I mean, word of mouth is our biggest, it's, it's huge. Um, so people recommending the service and interacting with it, luckily, is a, a big channel for us, but yeah, mobile. Week on week, month on month, just yeah. look at the numbers and it's getting bigger. Well, okay, we better, better finish there. And, uh,